Hi, good afternoon everybody, and I was worried that my talk was going to be negative. Um, <laughs> so, we're here today to talk about legacy, and I've taken that to mean what we're handing on to the future generations. And I want you to answer a question, and to do that, I want to invite you to kind of really zoom out. We've heard some great um, inspirational things this morning, but I want you to think of the level of our planet what's happening to our environment, what's happening to our economy, what's happening in politics. And if you feel proud of what we're handing on to the next generation, I want you to put your hand up. If you're not so proud, maybe in the middle, and if you don't feel proud at all, keep your hand down. Okay, okay. Okay, so some mixed emotions there. Um, so I don't feel proud. I am profoundly uh, disappointed with the way that our systems have become disconnected from the real needs of people and the planet. Um, so I'm here today to talk about how we could change those systems and how I see real promise in this generation of unlikely leaders coming through that could take us in a new direction. So I'm gonna talk about four things today. I'm gonna share with you why I feel passionately about this topic. Um, I'm then gonna share a bit about what I mean about systems change. I'm then going to look at, okay, if systems change is the work, how do we organize ourselves for that? And then finally, I'm going to share some insights that we've seen about these unlikely leaders. So firstly, why do I do this? Um, you might have noticed from my accent, I come from Scotland. I grew up um, just by this national park. This is Loch Lomond, just north of Glasgow. So it's beautiful, um, but it's also home to some of the UK's worst economic and social deprivation. I went to state schools, so some of my classmates were um, a product of this deprivation. Um, let's take, for example, Claire. Claire was in my class, she was my age, she was bright, but Claire grew up in a children's home. She was a product of neglect, and she followed any sign of affection that came her way. By the age of 16, she was pregnant, she dropped out of school, she became dependent on alcohol. I went on to university. It doesn't feel like we got the same fair chance at life. And I'm, I've been invited here today as one of these unlikely leaders. Um, I'm part of the team that runs the Finance Innovation Lab, which is a network of people who are changing the finance system so that it better serves people and the planet. Now, um, I have no expertise in finance. I do not occupy a senior position in my organization. And for a long time, I didn't want to be seen as a leader. Um, I'm sure, like some people here, I've been on the wrong side of bullying relationships, and that really held me back. I didn't want to be visible, I didn't want to be seen as a leader. But the more I work in systems change, the more I realize that what I thought were weaknesses were actually strengths. The ability to be vulnerable, to be open, to learn, and to question my own assumptions are actually absolutely integral if we are to chart a new direction for humanity. So that's a little bit about me and why I do this. So now we're gonna have a look at systems change. Now, up here is a picture to remind us of what our winter was like. And if this was Somerset, I might ask you to look away right now. because some painful memories up there. Um, so when we talk about systems change, I think one of the easiest ways uh, that I think about it is large scale change that better serves humanity. So let's pick a problem like climate change and apply some systems thinking to it. Um, and I'm going to draw on the work of a scholar, Donella Meadows, who has created um, a framework for looking at how we can change systems, the most effective way to do it. So I'm just going to uh, pull on three points that she raises that are, um, when we think about changing systems, we have to think about their purpose, the principles that underpin them and where power is. So if we think about climate change, um, how are we trying to solve this problem? Our governments are coming together internationally over a lengthy process and trying to solve the problem of climate change. And it's not working. Um, the International Panel for Climate Change just released their latest research. They're the most esteemed scientists on climate change. And um, they are warning us for more of the same, more natural mega disasters, humanitarian crises, massive disruption to our food systems. So when I see our governments coming together to solve an environmental challenge, I say that they, they've got the wrong purpose. Yes, we have problems that are showing up in our environment, 
but climate change is a function of the way that we organize our economic system. The purpose of our economic system, which I think is a more interesting question, is to grow. The ceaseless accumulation of capital. Now, um, what does that mean? That means massive amounts of production and consumption, and that requires a lot of energy. The massive um, extraction and burning of energy, which releases record amounts of CO2 into the atmosphere and causes climate change. So by growing our economy in its current model, we're growing climate change. And then if we look at principles, these are harder to spot. They're the kind of invisible cultural dynamics that shape everything that we do. Um, and there is a kind of ideology at play in the world, and it shapes our current norms and the ways that what we think is normal, what we think is right and wrong. And um, really, this positions human beings as fundamentally competitive and fundamentally individuals. So this plays out right across our lives. The logic of the market is applied to most areas of human life, from uh, our schools and hospitals to how our governments work. So what's happening in these climate negotiations is that one country may win in the short term, but we're all losing in the long term because we're not mitigating climate change. And then if we think about power in this situation, when we apply the logic of the market to how we operate, what we're, what's happened with governments is they've handed over a lot of power to the market. Um, so here we are trying to fix big problems like climate change, but actually governments have ceded a lot of their power over to the dominant players in the market, which are corporations. So um, I would say that that is a model that is not working for systems change. So now I'm going to have a look at alternative ways of organizing for systems change. And this is where I'm going to draw on some of my own experience in the Finance Innovation Lab. Um, the, these are the kind of design principles, if you like, that we work to. That we need spaces that allow us to be courageous, to ask some of those questions that aren't being asked in other places. Spaces that allow us to collaborate. We need to work together at scale if we're to solve these kinds of challenges. We need to experiment. When we're looking at change of this scale, we just don't know what the answer is, so we need to try out lots of different solutions. And finally, we need to create a different culture, one which is not all about the individual and competing, but one that allows for connection and for us to work together for the common good. So how has this played out for us in the Finance Innovation Lab? So um, six years ago, it started as all good adventures do, uh, between a conversation between two friends. So I work for <coughs> WWF, the environmental organization, and I was chatting to my friend and colleague, Jen Morgan. Jen uh, was working with the banking and finance sector, and she was becoming increasingly frustrated uh, that they would not look at the environmental impact of their investment decisions. They were quite happy to fund some of our work, but when she challenged them on some of their core business practices, they weren't interested. So Jen asked a courageous question. She asked the question, what would a financial system look like if it actually served people and planet? I was very inspired by that question, and I joined with Jen to start the Finance Innovation Lab. Now, we knew with that kind of question, we couldn't go out and ask it on our own. The WWF lacked credibility with the finance sector to ask that kind of question. So we went out to find some friends. Um, we were uh, amazed to find people asking more audacious questions than we were, in an accountancy body. <laughs> so we met Richard and Rachel, who work for the Institute for Chartered Accountants for England and Wales. And they too were concerned with the state of the finance system. And they joined us five years ago, and we've been a team ever since. Um, so we set off. We didn't really know what we were going to do. We didn't have a map. We didn't have a master plan. But we knew that we had to work to those principles of collaboration, courage, experimentation and to enact a different culture. So after uh, following five years of trial and error, we have developed a model which effectively allows us to um, bring together communities of change makers right across the finance system where they're developing lots of different solutions at once. So, um, <clears throat> and importantly, the thing that all these different groups have in common is that they are awake to the need for systems change 
and they're ready to take action because we've decided that the problems are so urgent that we're not here to wake anyone up. We just want people who are ready to work. So over here in what's called Create, we work with the pioneers. So these are people who are saying things like, what if we didn't have banks? What if I just lent money to you? What about crowdfunding? What about complementary currencies? So we work with them. We work with campaigners in civil society. We feel that there's a need for a strong moral voice calling for financial reform. And currently, a lot of these voices are fragmented and we provide a platform for these campaigners to come together to call for radical change in finance and we, because together they're stronger and they share a common vision and a common narrative. And then finally, we work with um, some mavericks in mainstream finance. So these are people who remain inside mainstream financial institutions but know that they have to fundamentally change if they're to meet the demands of the 21st century. So, for example, we're running a program with the auditing sector that is inviting them to repurpose their sector for the 21st century and to change their practices so that they better serve society. So, that's um, some insights from how we've organised in the Finance Innovation Lab. Now, it's not the answer, it's just, as I say, a kind of set of experiments that I'm sure will evolve from here. So finally, I want to look at the traits of leaders in systems change. As I said, that, um, I really see this generation of unlikely leaders coming through. And um, we've consistently seen some patterns in their qualities. And there are three qualities that really stand out. And they have become so important to us that they've become the principles by which we operate. And they are the behaviours that we encourage in everything that we do, every event, every programme, every communication. Um, and the first one <coughs> is systems thinking. So this is about thinking like an outsider, um, not taking anything for granted, trying to find the root causes of problems, always asking why, and importantly, working with other people to get multiple perspectives on a problem. And it's not just about looking at systems outside of ourselves. Um, we don't see the world as it is, we see the world as we are. So if we're really going to change systems, we have to look at our own mental models and assumptions and biases because they will be colouring the way we see things and probably limiting the potential for change. So if we're really about changing systems, we have to be about changing ourselves as well. And the word that sums this up for me is truth. Then we have higher purpose. What we consistently see with people who are uh, showing leadership for systems change is that they lead from the heart. They know what their values are and they act in alignment with them. And this is kind of uh, in counter to the previous speaker who was saying that we, you know, people find it very difficult to find their purpose. I think that's true. And I think the reason that that is is because we're not encouraged to do it. We're encouraged to become good at things that we... Um, get achievements for or we get well paid for, it doesn't mean to say that those are the things that we love to do. So really this is about finding out what it is that we love to do and putting that in service of the people and the things that we love. And this is really important because it's important for humanity generally and it's also really important for change because this is inspiring. This is what motivates people to join us and we need more of this. And the word that sums this up for me is love. And then finally, inspired action. With something as complex as systems change, we're always going to start before we're ready. We're going to lack information. We're going to lack resources. We're going to lack other people's belief in us. But what we consistently see is that people who are leading some of the projects that we're working on, that they always, um, they're the first ones to start. And other people may follow them. And what this means is it means making a lot of mistakes. So they're prepared to be vulnerable, they're prepared to be open and learn. And often they make these mistakes in public. And that's difficult because leaders don't want to be seen to be making mistakes, they want to be certain. So the word that really sums this up for me is vulnerability. And I think what these traits show us, at least for me, is it turns on on its head some of our kind of preconceived notions of leadership, that we often think of leadership as 
um, you know, the kind of commanding, charismatic, often male presence <coughs> at the top of hierarchies. And we found actually completely the opposite in our work. Um, so finally, I just want to share some impressions with you from, from our work and that sum up um, some of the ideas that I've shared here today. So I want to um, underline that we have complex, urgent challenges that we need to address, like climate change, and that this will mean fundamentally changing some of our systems. And that if we are to do that, we need to organize in a way that allows us to be courageous, allows us to collaborate, allows us to experiment, and allows us to enact a different culture that is based on connection rather than disconnection. And I think ultimately it involves us um, changing our assumptions about leadership. This is not about being the smartest or the toughest guy in the room. It's about practicing truth, love, and vulnerability. And um, yeah, I think this is gonna come from unlikely places. I don't think we should look for this kind of leadership somewhere far away in the corridors of power. I think that ultimately this kind of leadership is much more likely to come from rooms like these. So I think the message I want to leave with you is it could be you. Thank you. Thank you.